Well, hello there, everybody. So glad you've joined us here today on Facebook or on YouTube, wherever you are, however you got here. I'm glad you're here, especially those of you that might be joining us for the very first time today. Welcome. If we haven't met before, my name is Johnny, and I serve as the pastor here at Hello Discovery United Methodist Church. Today, we're going to be pondering this question. What does it mean to be saved? Uh, pretty uh, important word in the Christian faith, and I do believe that this can be one of the most un misunderstood components of the Christian faith. It's a word, saved, uh, that gets thrown a around a lot in our faith, and I want to take a look at it today. Now, we're not talking about the afterlife today, not that kind of salvation, not what happens after we die. Rather, this question, how does one move from a life of fear worry, restlessness, self-absorption, recklessness, uh, and general out-of-control behavior, short-sighted decision-making. How do we move from that life to a life of patience and peace, joy, hope, kindness, and goodness, generosity, and love? I used to think it meant believing the right thing. But over the course of my life, I've come to understand that the answers to my questions of faith don't necessarily lead me to real life change. We're going to look at the uh, letter that James wrote together to hopefully find the answers to what does it mean to be saved and how can I get there. <laughs> James, chapter 2, starting in verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So, I have lived in Texas all of my life. And there's something that me and the great nation of Texas disagree on. And that is allergies. I don't know about you, maybe you've lived here all your life, or maybe you're new to Texas, and maybe, hopefully you don't experience allergies, but I, most Texans I know, this is kind of common for us here, is that we all experience allergies at certain points of the year, during certain times. Me, it doesn't matter, it's outside, it's indoor, it's pet, it's whatever. You know, you get the itchy eyes, you get the sneezy, runny nose, you know, it's just something you come to live with. But the nice thing is, when it comes to allergies, is that there is medicine for that, that helps, you know, curb the side effects of, of what happens when allergies start running rampant. But here's the deal. Uh, I can have that medicine, but if I don't take the medicine, then I am not saved from my allergies. See, I can like the medicine. I can, in fact, love the medicine. I can understand the medicine and how it works in theory. I can know how it's made and how it works, and I can recommend that medicine to other people, in fact. But if I myself don't take the medicine, then what good is that medicine? Marcus Borg, somebody who I've loved to read, was a professor, theologian, and author. He passed away in 2015. Uh, he's written a great many books, but in his book, The Heart of Christianity, Rediscovering a Life of Faith, he says this, that the Christian faith is about belief is a really rather odd notion when you think about it. It suggests that what God really cares about is the beliefs in our heads, as if believing the right things is what God is most looking for. As if having correct beliefs is what will save us. And if you have incorrect beliefs, then you may be in trouble. 
It's remarkable to think that God cares so much about beliefs. Are you uncomfortable yet? He goes on to say, Moreover, when you think about it, faith as belief is relatively impotent. It's relatively powerless. You can believe all the right things and still be in bondage. You can believe all the right things and still be miserable. You can believe all the right things and still be relatively unchanged. Believing a set of claims to be true has very little transforming power. End quote. Now, Marcus Borg is not the only one to have wrestled with this idea. Uh, Jesus' brother, James, wrestled with very much the same thing 2,000 years prior to Professor Borg. This is a pretty famous passage of Scripture that we just read, one of my favorites, in fact. In fact, the whole book of James is pretty awesome. So if you've never read through an entire book of the Bible before, you might try this one on for size. It's only five chapters long, but it is packed with some really good stuff. But we're going to take a peek just here again at chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. What good is it, James says? And this is a question a lot of us people are asking today. It's a question that Borg asks. And I think it's a question that tons of people are wrestling, wrestling with when it comes to faith and church and life today. It's probably a question that you've wrestled with at some point in your life. Maybe you still are wrestling with it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? He goes on to say, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. And if you, a person of faith, says to them, go in peace and keep warm and well fed, but does nothing to actually help keep them warm or fed, then what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Maybe you've heard or memorized this, for, this verse this way, faith without works is dead. Maybe that's more uh, the way you've heard it. But essentially, faith ain't faith if it ain't working. That's basically what James is trying to say if he was born and raised here with Texas and has all the same allergies that we do. Faith ain't faith if it ain't working. But here's where we start to run into trouble Here's where the confusion comes in, especially for those of us that have been a part of church and church life for a long time. Remember when I said uh, that the answer to our question today, you know, how lives are changed might be more misunderstood and one of the most misunderstood components of our faith? Well, here's why. You might recall the Apostle Paul's words from Romans chapter 3 when he says, For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or maybe even the words found in the Gospel of John that say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whosoever, what? Believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So how do, they hear these, how do we hear these words of uh, John and his Gospel and the words of Paul? Paul, how do we hear that and then reconcile that against what James says, that faith without works is in fact dead? On the one hand, we say it's by faith alone that we are saved, and on the other, we say faith without works is dead. So how does this work? Well, we must understand that James's words here are not concerned with the afterlife, first and foremost. Those earlier words from Paul and John are about the afterlife. This is a fancy word that you learn in seminary called soteriology. It's how we are saved. It's the study of salvation. Um, so if you want to get fancy, you use that word. But James is talking about the necessary unity between faith and action. He's not talking about the afterlife. He's not talking about heaven at some other time. But he's talking about heaven here. His point is not that the actions are a substitute for faith which is often what gets confused. James's point is not that the actions of our life are a substitute for faith, nor are the actions a way of earning God's favor. I, I feel like I need to say that again. 
James's point is not that the actions are a substitute for faith, nor are they, are they a way of earning God's favor. Rather, what James is saying is that the actions reveal our faith. Our actions reveal our faith. So if your faith says, as James's um, uh, example would put it, if our faith says that we should wish someone well, that they, if they are cold and hungry and without food uh, or clothing, that we should wish them well, that they stay warm and be well fed. But if our actions do not provide that, then our faith doesn't really mean that. Our actions reveal our faith. So how are we saved? How our lives truly changed. Well, true change comes through active faith. This is not a statement about where you go or where you end up when you die. It's a statement about physical, spiritual, and emotional salvation now on this side of heaven. It's a faith that is not content with just being a believer. It's more than just belief. It has to be more than that. Because let's face it, you can know and believe all the right things about being a good and godly husband, right? I can believe all of those things, but if I don't actually act it, I ain't it. Right? I can believe all the things, and I can read all the books, and I can have all the head knowledge of being a good and godly husband, but if I don't act like a good and godly husband, then I am not a good and godly husband. You can believe all the right things about raising kids in the faith, but if we don't actively raise them in the faith, then what good is that belief? We can believe all the right things about living generously, but if we don't act it, then what good is that belief? We can believe the hungry should be fed. We can believe that we should serve others. We can believe all sorts of things, but what good is it, James would ask, if it is not actually lived? So I don't just want to be a believer. I want to be a disciple. I want to be an active follower of Jesus. I want a faith that has some action to it. So how do we do that? Well, let's look to Jesus' words. Matthew chapter 22, verse 35. One of them, an expert of the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? If we are supposed to be working within the law, and that's how we find salvation, then what is the greatest of those commandments? Jesus replies to this expert, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. See, people of faith in Jesus' time had lots of laws to help them be active in their faith. This is not a critique. This is actually kind of cool. This is the way people sought to be faithful. And while we, as a people today in our in, in, in Christianity might not have actual written laws. We have unwritten laws that we try to abide by that will help us stay active in our faith. But to help them in this time live in faithful relationship with God and in faithful relationship with others, they had laws, lots of laws, 613 laws to be exact, 613 laws to guide and define their lives as people of faith. And an expert in those 613 laws asks Jesus if he can identify one singular law of all 613 laws that has the highest importance. In a way, it's asking, if I can't follow 612 laws, I can only follow one of them, which is the one that I follow? Some might argue that they might be asking, what is the least possible that I could do, right? But I I give them a little bit more credit than that. This is an expert in the law matching up with a teacher of the day, and they're just having some friendly theological banter. Which is the most important? Which law brings God the most joy? Which one gets to the point of it all? 
And Jesus says, I can do you one better. I can actually not even give you the most important. I can give you the law that sums up all of the laws. And not just all the laws, but all the commentary from all the prophets and all the people that have written before. It's all summed up in this. And in fact, I'm going to give you two of them because really I'm going to give you the most important, but the most important cannot be done without doing the second most important. He says a disciple, someone who loves God, is actively and consistently and patiently pursuing an ever-deepening relationship with God and an ever-deepening relationship with others. Summed it all up for you. Someone who loves God, who is going to follow the law, all of the laws, all of the prophets, anything that's ever been said about God can be summed up in these two most important things. That you are actively and consistently pursuing an ever-deepening relationship, ever-deepening love of God, and an ever-deepening love of other people. Ever-deepening, ever-expanding means growing, means it starts to include people that you might not have included before. It loves generously and expansively. That is how you are saved. So we talked about Paul, and I don't want you to get it wrong here. Uh, Paul, when I quoted him from Romans about faith, you know, being the thing, the only thing that justifies us apart from the works of the law. That's not to say that Paul actually disagreed with what James would have said here. In fact, I would say that Paul actually agrees with that. Paul, if we take him out of context, can mean that there's no work that needs to be done in our life, right, as part of our salvation. But I would say that Paul would say, hey, you're getting me out of context here. Paul wrestles with the very same questions that Jesus faced and that James faced. Law, love, how are we saved? Is it faith? Is it works? Listen to what Paul says uh, in Galatians chapter 5. He says, the only thing that counts, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Galatians chapter 5, he's writing to this church, the people of Galatia, the only thing that counts, people, get this. If you get nothing else, get this right. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Uh, Verse 13 of chapter 5, you, brothers and sisters, were called to freedom. Only don't let this freedom be an opportunity to indulge your selfish impulses and desires, but rather serve each other through love. All the law has been fulfilled in a single statement. Woo, hear this, this is him leaning on Jesus here. All the law has been fulfilled in a single statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because if you bite and devour each other, be careful because you will be eaten up by each other. I say, Paul says to the people, I say be guided by the Spirit and then you won't carry out your selfish desires. Because a person's selfish desires are set against the spirit. And the spirit is set against one's selfish desires. They are opposed to each other. So you shouldn't just do whatever you want to do. But if you are being led by the spirit, then you are not under the law or the punishments thereof. The actions that are produced by selfish motives are obvious. They are empty. They include sexual immorality, moral corruption, self-centeredness, idolatry, drug use and addiction, casting of spells, hate, fighting, obsession, losing your temper, competitive opposition, conflict, selfishness, group rivalry, jealousy, drunkenness, carousing, and other things like that. I warn you, Paul says, as I have already warned you, that those who do these things will not inherit God's kingdom. But, he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against things like this. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the self with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit. 
here's what I don't want to happen. I don't want you to get caught up and lost in Paul's words as he starts to define some of the actions of the self and selfish desires. I think the church has gotten in trouble over the years of like trying to drill down specifically on he was making a full comprehensive list of ways in which the self and selfish desires manifests itself in our life. I think he is kind of on a roll when he's writing, and he's just kind of throwing out a lot of examples. Here, this goes back to what we talked about last week. Essentially, there's two ways of living, one that follows all selfish desires and impulses, and one that follows the Spirit, just like we read in Psalm 1 last week. There's a road to destruction and a road to life and vitality and fruitfulness. And while it might seem in our heads following our own selfish desires and selfishness would be the way to, uh, to vitality and thriving and fruitfulness in our life. In fact, it is the empty way. It's the way that will always come up short. It's the way that will always leave us wanting. But rather, to live by the Spirit is to choose to be planted, to be rooted near the source of life, and to grow and to thrive and to live life abundantly. We all suffer from a sickness. It's called sin. It is that wrestling within us to do and be the things that draw us away from God and draw us more inward toward ourselves. But we also have this hope for something more. As Paul puts it above, our flesh, our being, our selfishness, we gravitate toward destructive behavior. We don't know it's destructive at the time, but it's self-destructive and others destructive, ultimately. But there is a medicine, the Spirit of God. But is belief in the medicine adequate for combating the sickness? Can you believe enough right things about God and the Spirit of God and Jesus to be adequate in combating the sickness of sin in us. Well, according to Jesus, according to his brother James, according to Paul, the answer is no. Paul says the only thing that matters, brothers and sisters, is faith expressing itself in love. So, Knowing those things and the encouragement of Christ our Savior, Paul, one of our greatest theologians, James, the brother of Jesus, even Marcus Borg, and others like all of them. If I'm to take their encouragement, then I don't just want to be a believer. I want to be a disciple. I want to be an active follower of Jesus. I want to be somebody who is actively and consistently and patiently pursuing an ever-deepening relationship and love of God and an ever-deepening relationship and love of others. And by doing so, being shaped into a life that is modeled after Christ. So that not only my life will be changed, but I can be a witness to change that will invite others around me into the same salvation that I have found. So here's the question and invitation for you today. How are you manifesting the fruit of the Spirit in your life? How are you seeking after and actively pursuing goodness and kindness, patience and self-control in our classrooms, in our offices, in our homes, on the internet, with our families, with our friends, on I-35, in the grocery store? with our neighbors. How are we manifesting the fruit of the Spirit so that our faith isn't merely belief or stuck in our heads, but that it moves to our hearts and then out through our hands? Let's pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for this time that we have together. We give you thanks for the wisdom of your word as it has been passed down to us, that we might read it and find in it life and life abundantly. We just pray, God, that the wisdom that we find in Christ Jesus, our Savior and your Son, that we find in Paul, 
that we find in James, and that we find in the saints and thinkers and faithful people of our time. We just pray, God, not only gratitude for that, but that it might sink deeply into our hearts. It might find roots so that it might grow and bear good fruit in our lives. Because we long not simply to be believers, God, but to be followers, to be active members of the body of Christ so that we might be transformed by your grace and love and participate in the transforming power of that grace and love in the world. We pray all these things in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Savior, and we also pray together the words that he taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.